Sam Harris, title, I guess, uh, infidel. Well, I'm from Southern California, and uh, I was raised in a uh, totally secular home, so I'm not, I'm not reacting, in my criticism of religion, I'm not reacting against any kind of fundamentalist upbringing, and, um, but nor was I told uh, that there was no God. It was really not a, a, a subject of conversation. So my, my uh, rather strident criticism of religion is really a product of, of very recent events. I mean, in my case, it's September 11th, 2001. So it's my, my upbringing isn't so uh, informative of, of my views at the moment. Well, it was two things. One, just the, uh, the rather obvious liability of religious certainty was, was made um, extraordinarily uh, clear uh, on that day. I mean, we were having people flying planes into our buildings for explicitly religious reasons. Um, but was, what was also made clear is that we were going to deny the religious rationale uh, because of our own attachment to our own religious myths. I mean, the only language we could find as a culture to comfort ourselves was to endorse our own God talk. Uh, so I, I suddenly saw faith playing both sides of the board in a, in a very dangerous game, where we as a nation uh, in uh, prosecuting our war on terror, which was obviously a necessary thing to do, though calling it a war on terror I think is rather silly. Uh, but we, we, we were... Uh, consoling ourselves with our own religious certainties, you know, in the, very much in the language of, of Christian fundamentalism. Uh, the, the president comes before Congress and talks about God not being indifferent to freedom and fear. As an atheist, I hear that exactly the way I would hear someone saying Zeus is not indifferent to freedom and fear. I mean, it is a, an uncannily strange and empty utterance. Um, and yet... Uh, our culture is, is, is now programmed not to notice how strange and empty it is, and, and it does really significant work. And so we see things like stem cell research and um, uh, other uh, uh, causes that, that upon which the, the lives and, and, and happiness of millions of people really turn uh, get subverted by religious thinking, explicitly religious thinking. Well, I spent a lot of time thinking about and exploring uh, spiritual experience and our, our contemplative traditions, mostly in an Eastern context, in Buddhism and Hinduism. But I've also read much of the contemplative literature of Christianity and Judaism and Islam. Um, so I've been interested in religion for at least 20 years and uh, interested in spiritual experience and, and have spent a lot of time practicing meditation and studying with various meditation masters in India and Nepal and spending months and weeks on, on retreat just practicing meditation, um, very much the way a, you know, a monastic would in, in, in the Buddhist tradition. Um, so I, I'm, the concerns of uh, religious people, the ethical and the, and the spiritual concerns of religious people are, are something that I... Uh, I think I understand and I take very seriously. I mean, I, I take very seriously the possibility of experiencing the world the way Buddha and Jesus and other uh, famous patriarchs and matriarchs seem to have experienced the world. And I, I think we want to actualize that kind of experience. I mean, if it's possible to love your neighbor as yourself, I'm interested in learning how to do that. Um, I just don't think we have to believe anything on insufficient evidence in order to do that. certain senses of the term that I think are unobjectionable. I mean, you tell, tell someone to have faith in themselves, for instance. That is not to recommend delusional certainty. It is to recommend a kind of positive attitude in the face of uncertainty. I think that's totally healthy and necessary, and, and we, we should have that kind of faith. Uh, we shouldn't confuse that kind of faith with the faith that really is the permission that religious people give one another to believe things strongly on bad evidence. Very explicit things about the nature of the cosmos, what happens after death, the moral structure to this universe. So you have people believing that 
they're going to get 72 virgins in paradise if they die in the right circumstances in defense of, of Islam in this case. Um, that is a, a, a proposition about metaphysics and about what happens after death and about you know what this uh, almighty sadist in the sky wants human beings to do while alive. Um, and it's a, it's a proposition that for which there really is no good evidence. Uh, and so that kind of faith, the faith that says, oh, it's, it's, it's okay to believe that despite the fact that uh, there's no good reason to believe that, no real justification to believe that, uh, that's the kind of faith I'm criticizing. I think a false goal. I mean, we're not achieving. We're, we're achieving functional certainties in science and in just the, in our in our day-to-day lives. I mean, it's a functional certainty that I'm sitting here talking to you, though it's possible I could be dreaming or you know deceived by an evil demon. Um, I mean, those kinds of phil- philosophical, epistemological worries don't really relate too much to the ordinary practice of science, the very useful practice of science, and our ordinary. Um, task of just negotiating our lives and finding happiness in this world. Uh, we recognize that there's a, a range, there's a continuum of, you know, I'm not sure, you know, it's a coin toss, 50-50 uh, uh, understanding of a circumstance to being functionally certain uh, about what is so. And many people are pretending to be functionally certain or believe themselves to be functionally certain about things like Jesus is going to come back and judge the world in their lifetime. I mean, 20% of the American population claims to be functionally certain that that is going to come to pass, and 78% think that Jesus is going to come back sometime, not necessarily in their lifetime. Uh, and these certainties do real work for us. I mean, the, the, the person who's certain that uh, the soul enters the zygote at the moment of conception is the person who wants to veto stem cell research, uh, despite the fact that tens of millions of people are suffering conditions which, for which stem cell research is the best line of research to generate therapies. So these, these are ideas that are not just of academic interest or personal, private, spiritual relevance. I mean, these are, these are shaping policy. They're shaping a national conversation. And then when you look to the Muslim world, they are causing people to blow themselves up on street corners. conversation to get human beings to converge on a common project in which in which people can collaborate in an open-ended way in a non-divisive way in a way that that never requires a an appeal to violence and and we have that in science we have that in much of intellectual discourse we we very much don't have that in religion I mean, it, it's just there's nothing that a fundamentalist Christian and a fundamentalist Muslim can say to one another to put their beliefs on the table for, for revision. I mean, they, th- this is what dogmatism is. It, is. it is a willingness to believe things for bad reasons and an unwillingness to have your rather tenuous reasons challenged. I mean, it's, it's, you, you're, you're saying, I believe this no matter what you or anyone else says. So that's, that's the, it's the antithesis of conversation. It really is a, a, a conversation stopper. And so that's... Um, uh, that's why I paint a very stark difference between faith and reason. I mean, reason, if, if you're reasonable, if you're interested in how the world works and what is true altogether, you are open, you're by definition open to, to, to further conversation, to more argument, to more evidence. And you're, you're in fact interested to find out if you're mistaken about anything. If you are not predisposed to that, that, that open-ended conversation, um, you really have, you, have rendered yourself immune to influence from the world. Influence apart from just having someone, you know, uh, pull out the guns on you. I mean, so there are certain people, because of their dogmatism, who have made themselves impossible to talk to. I mean, there's just nothing that you're going to say to, to, to get Osama bin Laden to reconsider his view of the world. Um, and it's a unique feature of religion that we defend this mode of being. Uh, 
uh, in a religious context in a way that we would never tolerate it in another context. I mean, if, you're, if, if somebody has medical beliefs, you know, if, you're, if your doctor says, you know, I know this, this, this cures cancer, but, you know, I'm not going to tell you how or why or, or um, you know, I'm not going to have my data challenged. I mean, this is, that's a mode of talk within a medical context that, you know, you would never get through medical school appealing to those kinds of, of, of intuitions. Um, it, that really is the, the core of faith-based religion, this idea that, that there are certain things like that the Bible is the perfect word of God or that the Quran is the per- perfect word of God that just have to be accepted, cannot be challenged. Uh, and in certain contexts, certainly within the Muslim world, you can die for calling those certainties into question. I mean, it literally is uh, a capital offense to wonder whether the Quran may not be the, the perfect word of the creator of the universe. I mean, it's just, it, and it used to be a killing offense within Christianity. It's just, it's just we have moderated the Western religion, Judaism and Christianity, to a remarkable de- degree because of the last 200 years of, of scientific and political progress. Led by this this very term religion, we use this word religion as though it named a distinct thing, as, as though it named one uh, phenomenon in in human discourse. And there's really a range of of infatuations and practices that go by the name of religion, and and the, therefore many points on this continuum don't have much in common with with others. So if you take a religion like Jainism, you know, religion of India. Its core principle is nonviolence. I mean, this is where Gandhi got his conception of nonviolence. Um, the Jains are vegetarian. They they have no doctrine of holy war. In fact, they don't even have a doctrine, a uh, proper doctrine of self-defense. I mean, they're they're pacifists. They don't want to hurt a fly. Um, and then you, on the other end of the continuum, you have something like Islam, where it has a, explicitly a doctrine of holy war and a notion of of uh, you know combat and death in certain contexts uh, is is actually the highest obligation a, a religious person can can fulfill. So these are both religions. You know this is so religion is a word like sport. You know you have a sport like badminton and you have a sport like you know uh, boxing. They're not they're both sports that you know they're one is much more dangerous. Um, so I'm I'm concerned. I'm obviously more concerned about religions like Islam, that wherein you have this marriage of um, uh, a variety of spiritual and ethical concerns, but also uh, certain kinds of metaphysical certainties that inspire people to not only die but to kill others in the process. Um, and you don't have that in other religions. So I, I think we have to be clear about how this term religion uh, can can mislead us. I view religions as essentially failed sciences. I mean, the, the religion, religion was the discourse uh, that we had when all causes in the universe were opaque. We didn't know we didn't know the basis of anything. We didn't know why we were here. We we didn't know how diseases spread or what disease was. We didn't know how people. Uh, why people died early and why others flourished. We don't know what, what's causing you know, thunderstorms or co- causing crops to fail. Uh, and we very naturally, as a, as a, a cognitive and behavioral imperative, we, we form uh, descriptions of the world and we try to figure out what's going on. Um, we tell ourselves stories about our origins and about where we're going and about causes in the world. And those stories, given, given our just pervasive ignorance, and our, our disposition to see agency in the world, to see, you know, uh, to feel ourselves in relationship to the world, these stories entail being in relation to invisible friends, you know, and enemies. And we, so we have, you know, th- this parent figure in the sky who's going to take care of things if you live uh, rightly, and and we have other demonic presences that we should be really worried about. And gradually, uh, what what you see happening is that religion as 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 rationality and and dozens of specific sciences 